What really drove me is the same thing that drives me today, and that is passion. A passion for acting. I love it. And uh, if I had not succeeded in making a living as an actor, God knows where I would be. I mean, out in the street. Or so. I, I was ill-prepared in my mind to do anything else and never wanted to do anything else. And act he did. Becoming the man who played roles that the ordinary American could identify with. The protagonist who faced everyday challenges without being a hero. The actor who could make you laugh or cry. He was Hollywood's everyman. He was Jack Lemmon. <laughs> That's good! Jack Lemon, an only child, was born on February 8, 1925, to upper middle class parents, Mildred Burgess LaRue and John Euler Lemon Jr. Well, I was born just outside of Boston in Newton, Massachusetts. My father was in the baking industry all of his life with various companies. He ended up with the Donut Corporation of America. My mother had always wanted to be a singer. She had a very nice voice. Not a great voice, but a very good one. But her family apparently just said, no, you don't do that. Our daughter is not going into uh, show business. When I was a kid, I was a sickly kid. And uh, by the time I was about seven to eight years old, I guess, I had missed about a year of school altogether. The thing that pushed me into acting was uh, a sheer accident by replacing a boy in a school play who had one monologue. Well, I got into Billy's hat and cape, which is what he was wearing. It was a big, wide, black hat, like the bad guys in the westerns. His head is about 18 times the size of mine, it seemed, and this thing came down with the ears flopping down like this. The cape, which was supposed to come down around his ankles, was dragging behind me like Aunt Marie Antoinette's train or something. So I made my entrance, got a laugh right away, the way I looked. From that day on, not obviously because of any talent displayed whatsoever, because it was none, but purely because I was accepted by my peers, I loved it. I got into every play I possibly could while I was at school and I would start telling stories that I'd make up at night instead of doing my homework. The unusual thing is to know what you want to do by the time you're eight or nine or 10 years old, and I really knew by then that, that this is it. By the time I was about 10 or 11 years old, the doctor did a very smart thing. He said, uh, I want this boy to run every day or he's gonna be sick all of his life. As a result, I got in terrific shape as a kid and uh, became a very good runner and a very strong runner and uh, had a couple of records for kids my age uh, in distance running by the time I was into my teens. God bless my father. I was given an education that uh, it was the greatest, uh, Phillips Andover Academy and then Harvard. I worked as an apprentice in summer stock, building sets and this and that. And then when I was about 17, became an apprentice with the Marblehead Players. And not only was building sets and pulling curtain and doing all of the menial jobs, but also the, uh, the apprentices got to play small parts now and then if they were right for them. When I was at Harvard, I was in the drama club and the Hasty Pudding Institute. I was the president of that only, I think, because they decided it would be fun to run Lemon against a guy named Apple. And I won by about two votes, I think. In the drama club, I, I did a number of shows, and at one point we were very fortunate. A, a lady named Maud Howe from the Abbey Players. Somebody got her to direct a version of Playboy of the Western World. But I didn't play Christy, the lead. I played his father, who's 110. After college, 
young Jack set his sights on New York City. And when I was in New York, in that delicious period, as I call it, all the, the, in other words, the good old days, although, as usual, we, we, we think of the good old days, but we didn't know they were the good old days then. The only employment that I got for about a year or two was at a place called the Old Nick Music Hall, which was on 2nd Avenue. What they had was a bunch of tables and sawdust on the floor and everything, and they would run old movies. I'd play the piano to them. I did dramas with uh, Valentino and broad comedies with Keaton and Chaplin. Shortly after this period where I was working at the Old Nick, um, several things uh, that were very fortunate happened. Number one, I began to get a little work in radio and um, soap operas. I had a running part on Brighter Day and uh, Young Dr. Brent. And uh, that, that meant that I was getting some kind of an income, either $35 or $70 usually a week. That was terrific for me because I could eat for two bits. The real fun came after a couple of years, finally got a foot through a few doors in early television when it was still live. There was no tape, no film. God, I think I've been through everything in the world that, that you can go through on live shows. I did hundreds of shows. I must have done four to five hundred at least, all together in a period of about five or six years. But theatrical and film roles did not happen right away for young Jack, as he paid his dues on stage. Then his break came. Jack starred in a Broadway revival of Room Service. The show only ran for two weeks. However, it did land him a ticket to Hollywood. A Columbia Pictures scout recommended him for the lead role in It Should Happen to You, opposite Judy Holliday. He had to audition. And he bounced all over the room. He was full of personality. And uh, Judy said when he left, she says, I don't think so. I don't think he'll do. And we said, why not? She said, well, he's, he's much too young for me. And, uh, and we said, well, we'll keep thinking. And, and then Ruth took charge, and she spoke very, very seriously. And she said, now listen, you've just made it. You've made good. Don't stand in anybody else's way. Now you have the authority. Now you're important. Give someone else a chance. And she convinced Judy, and he wound up with the part. Mike, do you remember my name? Yeah, what? Pete Shepherd. Well, do me a favor and forget. Oh. So is it still on for Friday lunch? Certainly. Thank you very much. Don't mention. The first two weeks that Judy and I were doing our scenes, George would continually, at the end of a take with the camera, he would say, cut, wonderful, wonderful, that was absolutely wonderful. He says, we're going to print that, but just one more. Let's do just one more. Jack, less, a little less, less. And Judy and I went through about the third take, top to bottom, along about two and a half to three pages in one, and we knew that we had really kicked the bejesus out of that one. And uh, George, sure enough, said, cut. And he said, wonderful. And he gave Judy a kiss. And then he turned to me, he said, Jack, just one more, uh, less, just a little less. Hmm? And I, which was uncustomary of me, because I never blow up at a director. I couldn't help it. I said, are you trying to tell me not to act at all? And he said, oh, yes, God, yes. Oh, God, yes was the best piece of direction I ever got. In other words, behave in, in a way, but don't act, don't let it show, let it happen. It was during this time that Jack married his first wife, Cynthia Stone. Although the marriage didn't last long, they had a son, Chris Lemon, born in 1954. One year later, Jack's big break came when he was cast in the 1955 Mr. Roberts, 
for which he won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. They flew in last night, knockouts, and one big blonde especially. See, of course, she went for me right away, naturally. So I started to turn on the old personality, you know, and I said, isn't there anything in the world that'll make you come out to this ship with me? And she says, yeah. She said, yes, there is one thing and one thing only. I saw something last night that just about knocked me out. And I finally got to meet the great trio of uh, Hank Fonda and Jimmy Cagney and Bill Powell. I was just flabbergasted that I was going to work with these three people. They were all wonderful to me. Powder? This ain't no pop gun. It's a firecracker. I used fulminator mercury. I'll be back in a minute. Now, at the height of his comedic career, Jack Lemmon got to star with two of Hollywood's biggest icons, Tony Curtis and Marilyn Monroe, in the 1959 Some Like It Hot. <laughs> It was probably close to the second week of working with Billy before I realized that one of two things was going on. Either I was in something that was going to be a complete failure, or I was in something that could be a classic. I remember the day when we were testing them in their dresses, and he was dressed like, he played it like his mother would. And he had that hair fixed and did the frills and the, and the short dress and everything. Tony Curtis was all dressed in the woman's dress and he had uh, long hair and uh, now it turned out that he was too scared to get out of his dressing room. And uh, Jack Lemon took him by the hand like a nanny and dragged him out on the, onto the stage in front of the camera. My feeling was that I should never ever worry about the fact that I was in drag for 90% of the film nor should Tony, but especially my character. Let it go. There, it's impossible for this character, in other words, almost impossible for him to go over the top too much because of the way he was. And Tony was always the steadying influence there anyway. What happened? I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. He, uh does not over-assert himself. He, he just does it all very subtly. But he is the lead. He uh, does not have to press the tube, you know, because too much toothpaste comes out. No, no, no. He doesn't do anything that is uh, exaggerated. He's not a clown. He's just an actor who has mastered the, the, the art of, of, of comedy. But you don't understand, Osgood. Uh, I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. Now, Jack Lemmon is perfect. He was totally wrong not to marry him. Are we dressing for dinner? You know, just come as you are. So you're pretty good with that racket. You should see my backhand. I think the apartment was overall, it was in, in, in no way an attempt like Some Like It Hot to be a broad comedy. But it was, without question, one of the most brilliant scripts that, I, that I've ever had. Wilder won three Academy Awards that year for best film, best script, and best director. That's about all you can do. Billy really grew a rose in a garbage pail, is the way I have always described this film. He had a love story that was valid and honest, but it was grown in a garbage pail because he was making great social comment about a lack of morals and principles in the business community. And he had the guts to take his leading man and make him a pseudo pimp in a way, a guy who to get ahead was willing to sacrifice or just be blind to any sense of morality. He was made into somebody he very much regrets it at the very, very end when he's been made a vice president, I don't know what, he goes to Fred McMurray and gives him back the key. And he quits his job. In other words, he was a pimp against his own will, but when the big promotion is ready for him, he walks out on it. Did you hear what I said, Miss Kublik? I absolutely adore you. Shut up and deal. I loved working with Shirley. 
who is totally spontaneous. If anybody ever hated to rehearse it, surely she loves to just kind of let it happen, which I understand is one way of working. I can rehearse. I'll rehearse for five weeks for one scene. Now divorced, Jack married the love of his life, Felicia Farr, in 1962, with whom he had a daughter, Courtney. I think my best friend is my wife, Felicia Farr. We met when we were both under contract to Columbia Pictures a million years ago. I think that one of the reasons our marriage has been so successful is the fact that the both of us love to laugh. The same year he remarried, Jack was ready to take on a non-comedic role to show his true versatility and depth of acting. It was the role of an alcoholic in Days of Wine and Roses. And uh, anyway, my agency is uh, throwing a party, uh, or rather we're inviting the people for a party on Prince Harun Badul's yacht. The audience is sucked in, in the beginning of the picture, laughing at Jack Lemon, the Jack Lemon they know, until they get involved in the story and start to realize that this is not a comedy. This is a drama. Now, on the surface, this would seem to be a shockingly sensational type of situation, but the qualities of Joe Clay's story are not that easily revealed. And when I read this script, I knew that I wanted to play this part more than any part I have ever been lucky enough to play. One thing he said to me a while back, he said, if it scares me, I've got to do it. Well, that means he's going to stretch. That means he's going to explore areas that he hasn't been to before. And I think that process of investigation is where some of the greatest work for any actor uh, uh, comes out. And I really think you can almost see that at work in a lot of my father's performances. I truly think you can see it in Days of Wine and Roses. <laughs> Can't remember us ever feeling like this before. This is the same man. How can he be so different? What happened to Joe Clay? And from that day to this, whenever I've started to turn the film down and say, uh, well, now I think I'm going to have a conflict or there's another or this and that, if I basically stop and think, are you afraid of this? If the answer is yes, then I'll do the film. I represent Harry Hinkle. The cameraman who was hurt at the game today? Yes. Well, this may be of some interest to you. I'm suing CBS at Cleveland Browns and a municipal stadium for $1 million. Matthau and Lemon, they got together for the first time in a picture and did something called the fortune cookie. And uh, they have become now Laurel and Hardy. They belong together. Something I really believe strongly in, there is a phrase I use, good actors do not act at you. They act with you. And believe me, an awful lot of actors don't. They, they act at you. You could have a dummy sitting there, and when they hear a cue, they'll say their lines at the dummy. They are not really with you, and they don't listen. By listening, that never means listening to the words, but listening to the soul, listening to what's inside, what the real intent of the other actor is. I can with Walter. It's like sitting down and having breakfast with him. Uh, we can do it without rehearsal, practically. Well, we seem to bounce off each other. And we're different physically. He's short and ugly. I'm tall and handsome. When I work with Walter, and it, and it, and it, 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 it is working, that there are three stars. There's me, there's Walter, and there's the two of us. And I think that's right with any good combination. How many me do you see? One. One cheap, chiseling, shyster lawyer who, of all people, had to marry my sister. Nice talk. I'm handing you a quarter of a million dollars on a silver platter. <laughs> Having Walter and Jack in The Odd Couple was probably the best thing that's ever happened to me in my film career. I'm telling you. You're the only one of its kind in the world. Chemistry, uh, not even chemists can explain why it happens between two people. 
when it's right and when it's not right. They were probably right from the day they, were, they first met, or maybe they were wrong. I mean, maybe they hated each other's guts, which worked for them, and they got to love each other. I have no idea of the birth of it, but thank God it was born. Now listen, why don't you just take a tranquilizer? Go to your room. Yeah, let's go to your room. Let's just all settle down, huh? When we did the scene, pretty famous scene now, of Jack and the luncheonette and the, and the odd couple suddenly getting these uh, adenoidal attacks and making these uh, sort of moose calls, as uh, Oscar would call them, um, Jack surprised me because I didn't even know what to expect. Stop that, will you? What are you doing? I'm trying to clear up my ears. You create a pressure inside your head, it opens up the eustachian tube. Did it open up? I think I strained my throat. I remember when I did Save the Tiger, which is one of my favorite films, because, again, I felt that it had something to say, that, that, that it could enlighten people, whether people agreed with its premise or not. I was profoundly moved by something that Jack Guilford said in character, and that was that it used to be a crime to do such and such. The crime today is to get caught. We invented a new kind of arithmetic last year. But we survived. We kept our people working. 71 girls, 14 salesmen, secretaries, all making a living. Phil, the government has another word for survival, and it's called fraud. You, me, fraud. But you haven't been out in that street for 38 years. You want to start looking for a job now? Neither do I. I want to be in love with something. Hey, just an idea. Dog, a cat. Hey, something. He's a complete actor, and he showed that time and time again in his career, which started with him as a sort of a quirky, bright, young, fast-talking comedian in his early movies. And we all know that he's progressed into being the closest thing to an American Olivier that we have, at least in my opinion. And Jack Lemmon was the winner for Save the Tiger. And I don't think I ever had a more enjoyable, satisfying moment than being able to hand Jack his Oscar for the best performance of the year. The characters that I have played in the important films have one thing in common. The character has to make a choice. He has to decide where the priorities are, what's right and what's wrong. The guy in the black hat is Save the Tiger. The guy in the white hat is in China Syndrome. We'll be at full power by midnight. No, you cannot run it at full. We can't risk What's another scram. We, oh, so we, we have you, a you been drinking. What the hell are you talking about? Drinking? For Christ's sake, there may be a defect in the pump support structure. I got it. Wait a minute. Listen. I got my orders. There was a vibration. Dad, so help me God, a sudden surge could kick that off again. His choice of roles seemed to fit his personality, uh, which, you know, is, is one of somebody that's very liked, uh, therefore could be somebody that's taken advantage of, uh, as he was in the apartment. But at the same time, he's had heroic qualities, uh, such as China Syndrome, where he stood up against the establishment. Group one. I did, Jack. Okay, leave it there, Jim. Oh, Jesus Christ, Jack. Just get out. And what's so wonderful oh, about it out. is that you don't know when it's going to come. It just suddenly comes like a thunderstorm, a clap of thunder, and it's there, and it shocks you, and it gives you a sense of relief of, thank God, he finally is saying it. He's finally opening up. Jack would end up starring in over 60 films during a career spanning 50 years. After the China Syndrome, 
He played the outraged father in the 1982 political thriller, Missing. He would star with Al Pacino, Alec Baldwin, Kevin Spacey, and Ed Harris in David Mamet's poignant 1992, Glen Gary, Glen Ross. And he would reunite three more times with his comedic buddy, Walter Matthau, in Grumpy Old Men and Grumpier Old Men. And finally, his last major film, The Odd Couple 2, in 1998. Jack passed away three years later, on June 27, 2001. He was 76 years old. All through his career, you've looked at uh, the work that he's done with uh, so many great actors or, or teams, whether it's Matthau or McLean or Tony Curtis, and how his ability to adapt to both drama and comedy um, and always be uh, true to the material and always be listening and always be aware and, and sharing the space. There's no doubt that he's a star, but he's a star with such a lack of ego. He works well with everyone. But it, he just fooled you all the time because you don't think he's going to be able to do that. But he does. I mean, other actors of today, big stars of today, work in the same area. They're brilliant at it, but they don't open up into something else that will surprise you. Jack is there opening up all the time. Actually, what we are, you, you know, the odd couple, we did it in the movies. Well, now we're the old couple. We identify with them no matter what walk of life we're in, no matter what. Uh, age we are, um, and that's something that you're just born with. And I imagine it goes back to the way he was raised and the kind of relationship he had with his father uh, and things that just come naturally to him that sort of, for whatever reason, when that camera gets turned on and, and Jack says, as he does before every single take and every night before we walked on to uh, the stage in Long Day's Journey, Jack just whispers under his breath, magic time. Um, and uh, it truly is magic time, which I find.